Max for inviting us to Max Yoga Live um, and to your community, Max, and, mm. uh, and to invite us to share with the other people that already practice with us. So welcome everybody on this dark moon. Um, this is the little informal chit chat to break through the nervousness. Um, <laughs> so in our ordinary thinking minds, we're often a lot of chitter chatter before we get into a focus. Today, dark moon, just know that wherever the sun is at the moment, the moon is slightly above it and a little bit to the left. The moon will be setting 15 minutes um, after the sun today. So we've had our uh, lunar eclipse, I mean our solar eclipse, uh, sometime during the uh, early hours of this morning. The significance of the dark moon for us today is that it uh, is a completion of one full vinyasa for the moon cycle. Uh, the coming to the end and then of course the beginnings of new. So this is a timely um, presentation for everyone that's watching that it's a, a new beginning or a new uh, opening for you to enter into um, new realms of experience in terms of your own personal practice. Um, to really start formally, let's ask Julia to do the Sahana Vavatu chant yes, first. Chant. So please sit comfortably, sit tall. It's probably um, a good thing to translate that chant, as we don't normally have time to translate chants in class. So the Sahana Vavatu chant is to um, call in all of the great teachers that uh, have gone before us, to call everyone together uh, to be protected, uh, surrounded by the principles of yoga, and that uh, Sahana Bunak too is that we can all come together to nourish one another. And when we nourish one another, that means we, we feed one another, we grow together, we bud together, we can blossom together and shine together. Uh, Sahaviram Viyam is with great energy for us to come together as uh, one collective consciousness. And that collective consciousness creates a great focus and energy for us to even just share this time together with. Um, and may this experience that we have uh, for this short period of time be um, effective and long lasting for you. But more importantly for us is that because of the period that we're in, Ma Vidvi Shabahai is that may we not have a uh, dispute with one another, but I translate that slightly different is that we really want to be able to hear the student's voice and we are all students and we all have a voice and so um, in order for us to be validated with that voice we need to have our, our experience on the mat our self-practice and so um, what uh, provides the space for Julia and I for example to be sharing with you is that we have done our practice uh, we've done our own self-inquiry and that inquiry continues and so over the years I've been able to add my voice to the narrative of yoga and so this this presentation is really for you all to understand that every one of us has that ability to share an experience and add 
to and their experience to this the big great story of yoga. So what I wanted to uh, say that John is not always translating the mantra, but when he's doing it, it always makes me feel slightly emotional because you understand from the words how important these lines are and they exist beyond time and space and by invocating them we kind of are opening that space when we all protect it when we all have a great respect to one another and it is very important also the chant has its vibration no matter if we know the words if the, we know the meaning or not it work itself but if we done the work if we translated ourselves especially if we did found our own translation which which is becomes dear to our heart every time we stand on the mat and we chant the mat and then we remember what it really means to us and the chant really resonates much greater with our heart, with our whole being. And so let's continue on then with the theme. The theme is establishing a self-practice. So Julia and I have our formula that we use both in class and we replicate that formula when we do our self-practice. So uh, because it's afternoon, what I'd like to, to introduce to everybody is a simple, 15 vinyasa uh, spinal stretch for we are only as young as we are flexible in the spine so this also begins um, a, particip a participation from from you the audience to join in with us and also those that are completely new to my and uh, julia's presentation um, we're not actually teaching per se the actual 15 moves but see if you can follow I must just clarify here at the moment, I won't be doing the full stretch myself because I'm in recovery from a, um, an injury to my eye. I've torn the back retina of my eye. Some, something abrupt has torn my retina and I'm having um, laser treatment at the moment. So um, I can't move my head fully. So I'm in recovery, but uh, we can share with you the 15 stretches to start. So sitting with your... Uh, in a comfortable seat, interlock your fingers and ache one, inhale, extend up, look up. Dway two, exhale, fold the arms, you can join with us. Head down, three knee three, inhale, extension up through the arms. Now the hands to the heart, head up. Shat six, exhale, press the hands and heart away. Sup to seven, inhale, extension up through the spine. Now side stretch to the right side. Ashto, exhale down with the head. Inhale, rotate the head, look to the hand. Exhale, look down. Another inhale, come all the way up, extension through the spine, head up. And then to the left side, desha, exhale, head down. Inhale, look to the left hand. Exhale, look down. Ekadasha, inhale, come all the way back up, extension through the spine. Spiral down into a little ball on the right side. Then inhale, spiral tall. And then exhale, look far to the right. Try the shah 13, inhale, extension up through the spine. And chatter the shah 14, spiral down to the left side into a little ball. And then inhale, spiral tall. And then exhale, look far to the, to the left. Punch of the shah, inhale all the way up. And exhale, release the hands to the side. And so let's see if we can then use that 15 stretch to invigorate through the, the central core of your body. And I'd like to take you through a short uh, visualization meditation um, and to acknowledge the dark moon period that we're, we're in. And I call this the posture of eclipse. So we need to use our imagination. And first of all, to clarify that, that uh, I want you to remember that when you were born, when you were born, you were born with four siddhis or four superpowers. And those superpowers are the power of awareness, one, 
two, the power of attention, and three, the power of inquiry. And from the power of inquiry, number four is the power of imagination. These are really important superpowers that we all have, and most of us have forgotten them or lost them. And it's an ex example why there's not so much attention and consciousness in terms of where we are in the paradigm that we're existing in. So I'm wanting you to explore the power of imagination and see if you can go with a little journey to the posture of eclipse. So we can close your eyes and just listen to the voice. And with your eyes closed, I want you just to first of all exhale. And then inhale. On the next exhalation, as you exhale down into your pelvis, imagine that the pelvis is your earth. And then as you inhale, inhale tall through the spine. Again, exhaling down through the line of the spine, all the way down through to the pelvic floor, to the coccyx, the pelvis being the earth. And then I want you to imagine on the inhalation that your head is the sun. A great distance between head sun and pelvis earth. Inhaling the length and exhaling all the way down to earth. With the head, it's like noon, 12 noon at the equator. And imagine that great distance that helps you sit tall. Now, my teacher said to me, there's three regions of the body, the pelvic floor, and the floor, and it's the balance. control towards the lumbar and towards the navel. sitting, exhaling down through our pelvis earth and inhaling, sitting tall through the head sun. So align the head sun directly over the pelvis earth. And then with the subtle control of the abdomen and the lumbar, to direct the energy into your heart, heart moon, to bring the heart moon perfectly aligned between head sun and pelvis earth. When this alignment occurs, we get a solar eclipse, an internal solar eclipse. So we sit in our own inner light, our own radiance, or our own nimbus, which is a halo. And this is the position that I call in the present moment, it's the eclipse where we meet our selfless self. Not our self in the past or our self in the future, but the self right now that's in the present moment of service. And it's in this place that we then want to take you through a focus 12, and once again, it's another technique that most of you probably have not uh, been ex experienced with. Um, and I just take you through very simply. On our hand, we count to 12, Dwadasha, using our thumb as a counter, and we count Ekam Dwe Trini up the index finger, Chatwari Pantsa Shat across the tips, Sapta Ashto down the little finger. Nava, Desha across the bottom, Ekadasha into the center, and Dwadasha. This creates a beautiful spiral like our spiral galaxy or the uh, conch, the nautilus shell, the conch that Patanjali holds in his hand. Patanjali also has a chakra, wheel of time. This is to hold time in your hand. And he also has a sword, which is the Asi or the 
um, the technique, the discipline. So this is a discipline to start as into Pratihara, to start as into Dharam. It's 12 focused breaths. Each breath is about six seconds long on the exhalation, which is Rechaka, and six seconds on the inhalation, Pura. And so if you just follow uh, with me, you'll see my left hand is the counter and my right hand is going to be the breath. Okay, so once again, sitting with vertical spine, let's all breathe in together synchronously. And then red chakra. Ekam poraka. Ekam, moving your thumb up the finger, red chakra. Doi poraka. Dway, thumb tip of the finger, red chakra. Trini, poraka. Trini, red chakra, tip of the second finger. Chatwari, poraka. Chatwari, red chakra, tip of the ring finger. Pancha Poraka Pancha Rechaka, tip of the little finger Shat Poraka Shat Rechaka, in the middle of the little finger Sapta Poraka Sapta Rechaka, the base of the little finger. Ashtau Poraka. Ashtau Rechaka, the ring on the ring finger. Nava Poraka. Nava Rechaka, the base of the second finger. Desha Poraka Desha Rechaka, the middle of the second finger Ekadasha Poraka Ekadasha Rechaka, the middle of the ring finger Dwadasha Poraka The water shower and exhale. Okay, so we could just start to talk about the topic of today's meeting and it's set, setting and self-empowerment. Setting, it means the place we do our practice and at that moment we're practicing in our home spaces we're given this opportunity to practice uh, with our own selves, which is sometimes very rare. So I think it's a really good thing to be grateful for. And no matter how really your setting looks, is it, um, does it have a little altar like we have? Does it have a candle or this very simple empty space? The most important is actually your energetic imprint, that every day you come to your mat, that you practice day by day, week by week, and you live in this energy. Also, the energy field of that place starts to influence you and take you to the focus place. And after some time, it became your self-healing space. About the uh, your mindset, uh, we just did the teaching chant. And before every practice, we do our opening chant. And besides that, you can also do your kind of a private uh, intention. And depend on what you want to achieve or you want to wish from that space 
or you want to heal yourself or others, you can use this. You can use that intention. For example, when John started his um, practice 30 something years ago, one of his first uh, intentions was flexibility, stamina, and strength. But after some time, after his 30 years especially, it changes uh, because you do transform through your practice. And for example, now when we have um, when we're in circumstances of being locked down, when there are a lot of people experiencing pain, uh, anxiety, fear, which comes because we're all connected in this field. One of the things that we can do is to, with every inhale, to take pain and suffering in, destroy it in our strong heart, and exhale love and light out. We can also, if we can't do it for someone because it's too big a concept, we can do it just for ourselves, just to take our own suffering in and pain and exhale and give to the space love and light out. And I would like John to talk about the self-empowerment. Thank you, Julia. So Julia is introducing mantra, that she's saying pain and suffering in and love and light out. That's an overlay on the breathing on your inhalation and your exhalation. Um, so the self-empowerment comes from really the solo self-practice. I'd like just to, to share that my first teacher was Derek Island, and um, I was very lucky to practice with Derek while he did his self-practice. And at that stage, um, Derek had hadn't been to Patabi Joyce himself. He'd been a um, Shivananda teacher. And their style was very much a talk through. And so I would follow um, Derek through as he talked me through. And when I left Derek, it was another year and a half before I got to, to Mysore. So for uh, a year and a half, I practiced by myself with a Sunny Walkman uh, and listened to Derek's talk through. And so when I arrived in Mysore, I had Derek's voice in my head. Um, and it took a while for me to really listen beyond Derek's voice and my own internal dialogue to hear Patabi Joyce. And at that stage, when Julia said that my, my intention was very much strength, stamina, and flexibility, because in those days I was very... Uh, outward seeking in my, my journey, very materially based, and I was challenging myself in terms of uh, the, each asana, each sequence, and to, to achieve and compete with myself. And this Patabi Joyce, he really got me one day when he pointed his finger at me, and he said, that man, as he was looking at me, that man is only exercising. And it took me by surprise, and it was like a bolt of lightning that went into me, because I thought I was giving my 100% my to the practice. And I didn't realize that what he was trying to explain to me, that it was my own meditation that I needed to understand. His words were mind control. And so that's where we get the mindset from. So mind control, in a sense, yoga is just a practical means to mastery over your mind, your breath, and your body. And in, in my sort, the same thing happened, that I practiced three months with Toby Joyce, the very first visit, and then he said, you go home and you do self-practice. Now, as Julia said, this is 30 years ago. There were no schools or shalas or studios to go to. And so I entered into what I now call a self-inquiry. So I'm very lucky that I started to inquire into, and I've always been questioning when I'm practicing and when I'm sharing the practice, what is it that I'm doing? Why am I doing it? And what am I saying when I'm passing this on? And so for a period of time, I had my first teacher, Derek Island's voice in my head. It took a while to get Patabi Joyce's voice in my head. 
And then it took a while for me to realize that Atabi Joyce was directing me to my own voice. And so he called it mind control, but it was through what he called the counted method. And so when we did our focus 12 and our 15 stretches, we were counting in Sanskrit. And what I finally realized in my soul was what Patavi Joyce was doing was passing to me. He was giving to me the mantra. So we all have what I call the ordinary thinking mind. This is the manas mind, that's our processor. And our manas mind is where all of the imprints, all of our experiences, all of our seeds of action uh, are imprinted into. And it's fed through the senses and we interact in and out of our internal world and our external world through the senses. And often this can become too busy, too noisy, with too much connection to the material world. And we don't get to use our buddhi, our intelligence. And so when we look at mind control, the question is, why do we have mind? And one answer is this, that we have mind to live intelligent. And the second one is to then use that intelligence, the mind to turn the mind in on itself to understand what is mind. And so when we are looking at the self practice or looking at the asana, the sequences, we can get a little confused. What are we actually doing? And so for me, the, um, the content of my personal practice, the quantity of my personal practice, that's purely my discipline. That's what I'm on the mat to do. But what challenges me in that practice is to, to ask, where is my mind? And so with my mind then, it's in a state of inquiry. Why am I doing this? So I'm always asking myself, where am I? And where have I come from? Where am I going? What, what am I doing? And so what I need is a tool or a technique to be able to empty out the conversation that gets in the way. And so... The Tabi Joyce was like a transcendental meditation teacher. When he was counting, and this is in self-practice in my soul, there was only eight of us in the room, he was counting each individual uh, through their vinyasa. And what ended up happening was that Lina Miale and myself, we took uh, clipboards into class and we then said, okay, um, Tabi Joyce, please tell us the count. Please tell us the count. And we wrote the numbers down and the sequencing for every asana that we were practicing and hence uh, published our own work. When I look at that, I then realized that the teacher was giving the student the information and the student then takes the information. That information has to be practiced. It has to be questioned. It has to be explored for to be a contemplative practice that transforms a um, exercise based practice into more of a spiritual practice meaning that when you go into self inquiry you're on a journey and this journey is a life journey I mentioned that I'm uh, having to be uh, cautious of my eye I'm in recovery we're all always in recovery from something and Julia mentioned that we're here on lockdown. And so what we're actually recovering now is that all our um, support systems have been taken away from us. Those of us that rely on classes to go to um, our shala each morning uh, before we go to work or whatever our daily routine is. And this is now a golden opportunity we can use Zoom for a type of class that we're doing now where we can come together and meet the teacher. Um, or we can meet from time to time to kind of connect the teacher, but at the same time we have opportunity to at last do it ourselves. And this is really rare. We had a, a lovely call today with one of our students 
and we didn't know that she was tell us uh, that story, but she said, I'm ex it's the first time I'm always in the shower and it's the first time I'm in Finland and I'm just doing my practice. And sometimes I'm just doing sun salutes and sometimes I'm doing whole practice. And John, Julia, I'm just having so many revelations. And this is such a great moment because very often when we're even in the shala, we're still observed by the teacher. So our practice is also changing because every object by the observation does, the change, does change. So we don't have this opportunity to really understand how much energy we put in ourselves or how much energy the teacher gives us so we could do our practice. How much we really exploring or we're just holding the space and just doing what we're told. So it's, it's such a good moment now to just let go of the fears and don't try to connect to, you know, to any class, but just really start to be with our own self. Like um, now John is, I'm, I'm, really amazed that John is experiencing his practice only by visualizing it. And it brings so much new inquiries. What is really a practice? Because it is no, not really matter our uh, first, second, third, fourth se serious practitioners because we will always will have to let go in some point. So that place, the mat, is only your playground to explore where you are in your body, where you are in your energetic body. And every time you practice, you're kind of trying to just let go and give yourself more freedom to understand that you are not, you are not so bound into that material world with so many cultural, educational, and so on rules. And every time you practice, you're kind of trying to let go of that massive information from the world we live in and from the material world and put some space for your cosmic consciousness, for your connection with your higher spirit. And it is amazing that we do have opportunity to connect to the teacher. But in some point, I mean, we're all gonna die and we're all gonna, we will have to really to connect ourselves. So in this time when there is so much fear going on, we have to really, let our heart shine for our own selves so we could be a good an example for the others for the practice for giving them the strength and if we won't find the strength in our own selves it's really hard to pretend to others that we really have it thank you julia um well one of the things that julia um, inspired me with was a, a new term for practice and and the place where we practice is being the, the playground. And uh, I think when Julia first met me, that's what she was drawn towards in terms of me as a teacher was how playful I was in terms of my inquiry. And so 30 years of self-practice, I, I, I don't go to class. <laughs> so I, I haven't been to class. I've only ever a couple of times been to other teachers just for, for the sheer joy of going to, to, to meet a friend. Um, so my whole life has been uh, uh, like a Jonathan Livington Seagull. And I'd like to remind it's us... It's a lovely book. John, Jonathan Livingston Seagull is a lovely book for every yoga to explore. It's a really beautiful tiny book for one day and there's so much information, inspiration that you just really take it on board if you never had it in your hand. So by Richard Bach, Jonathan Livingston Seagull by Richard Bach. And it reminds us what um, yogis were really about. We, we are in a sense outcast to society. We leave society because we feel that the paradigm that we're living in just doesn't feel right. And we want to really explore what it is to really be you. I would say that there what is, is much your true more and natural self. What we've shown is. And so um, Jonathan goes uh, to the far cliffs and he just really wants to learn to fly. And the book's all about flying. And so for me, what I've done is very much as Jonathan, I've really explored what it is that my teacher gave me. And when people ask me, who, who, you know, since your teacher's passed away, uh, and who is your teacher? And I keep on saying, Patabi Joyce is still my teacher. Even though he's passed away, there was so much information that I received that there's still 
much more than I have got to inquire into and keep inquiring into to see that's what he meant, that's what he meant. And so by doing my own solo practice, I feel free, like Jonathan, to really explore without, as Julius says, the observer watching me. Because the moment that we have an observer, we actually change the way we behave. And, and in some cases, we then create a boundary or a restriction to, to what we're doing. The, the self-practice initially may feel, you may feel lost because you, you, you haven't got the directive of the teacher. And this is what we have to take on board, that we have to learn how to self-motivate, have to self-inspire. And if I go back to those four cities, those four cities, the power of awareness, the power of attention, um, the and power of inquiry, and the power of imagination. One of the things that I imagine is that from, from my fingertips to fingertips, from my nose to my toes, I'm just unlimited expression of consciousness. That is just consciousness coming into a form that I can see. And so it's me who binds it to its limitations. And if I can just go into that place of imagination, and the moment I close my eyes, so I often have a blind practice. As Julia says today, I'm, I'm not doing a physical practice at the moment. I'm actually doing a visualization. I have a blindfold on or my eyes closed, and I use my imagination to experience the practice. But what's keeping me in the sequence is the mantra that my teacher gave me. Quite simply, as I'm going through my visualize, I'm going Ekam, Due, Trini, Chatwari. I've got a mantra that's running all the time. And so what that mantra does is it clears away all of the stuff that gets in the way. All our fears about what is it, is it to be practicing by myself? What do I do? When I started to share the practice with Patabi Joyce and asked them, how do you share this? He said, you first you start with Surya Namaskar. And so those of you that would like to try complete solo self-practice, what you do is you start off with your beautiful space that you have. And as Julia says, you, um, you can have a candle or not a candle, or whatever. Something that's just a sacred space that's going to start uh, being your place of healing. Sure. And you just begin with it. Just, just so we could have time for Kuna, I'm just saying that we have Kuna. <laughs> <laughs> so you would know. Uh, are you keeping aware of the time there, Max? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have time, John. Up to you, Julia. You know. I'm you know just, I don't know if okay. we have, are we restricted with the time or not? That's why I'm just uh, looking at, at, at that. Because we're not in a hurry, but just... It's, uh, 540 on my iPhone, so... Okay. Well, I just wanted to, to, to say that, that for me, the practice that the, what the mantra does is it is the, the vehicle or the way to find out who you really are transcended of all of the ordinary chitter chatter that we have. We live in a dualistic reality. I like this. I don't like this. Um, for example, we are in a polarity of opposites. Even even now, when there's so much going on in the, uh, about the COVID, there's so much polarities. And if we're going to just go in there, we will be completely lost. And there's only a one way to find our own focus. And if we don't really have uh, real knowledge of what's going on, we just have to have our intuition. And the only way you can connect to your intuition is to connect with your breath, connect with your body, connect with your center. And just feel yourself and then know how you need to navigate through that time through that world because because otherwise you we are actually lost so i'm calling my practice transcendental ashtanga vinyasa yoga to transcend the ordinary thinking mind to open up into the expanded consciousness and <clears throat> what that then happens is is you start to reclaim yourself through your imagination, you reclaim your inquiry into who you are, what you are, and what this life is about. And through that, you find that your attention to detail of what it is you're actually doing improves, and then your total awareness. Now, awareness 
is a different state in mind. Uh, it's a different uh, level of consciousness. It's transcendent of thinking. Uh, thinking is either in the past or in the future. When you transcend that, you're in the moment and you're in um, respond rather than react. You respond to your situations. And so what happens is in the beauty of self-practice, the empowering aspect of it is what I call adhikara. And adhikara is to own self-knowledge, knowledge of the self. So the main focus of a yoga practice through a very physical dynamic uh, body experience, we're trying to go through the body, through the breath, into the mind to realize that we're much more than the limited boundary body. Our breath is that expanded uh, pranic force of information. And so we can transcend this limitations of the duality and arrive in a non-dual place. And it's in that non-dual place that Jim is talking about, that heart place is the place where we're able to heal ourselves, to, to in the process of healing ourselves, really meet ourselves, our true nature, and our connection to the environment around us and the people around us. We're then able to be in that place when we're selfless to be able to have uh, the, the two beautiful E's, empathy and ego, that your ego is no longer keeping you separate and into that production consumer society. It's allowing you to have empathy and feeling for others. And it's when you have that empathy and feeling for others that you want to share this practice. And now to share the practice, you need to know what it is you are sharing. And, and in that process, you have to ask yourself, what am I doing? I say I'm doing my yoga. And in that process, it sets up a beautiful inquiry. And that's why we want to just sort of share with you as our first presentation online live is that this time right now, this lockdown is the perfect, perfect time for you to, to yes. create a space for yourself to meet yourself on the mat and say, what do I know? How much have I learned from my teacher? And if you, if you feel lost, then you make this connection through your Zoom to your teacher and say, look, can you give me some guidelines what I need to do to get started? Yeah. And I think, I think this is an, an opportunity for us to be supportive, but not necessarily supportive by trying to repeat the same patterns. This, the online for me at the moment feels like we're trying to repeat the classes that we've lost. And people are saying, what's going to happen after this? It's not going to be the same. So we have to look at, at responding to the, the, the situation rather than reacting to the situation. And my response to the situation is this is a beautiful time for us to really learn some self-practice. Julie, you got anything to add to that? We maybe no, then open no, up for some questions. If there's any questions, we will be. So we open the chat now, yeah? This is how it works. Um, so it's fine to see. John, if you if you like, also we can do the question directly from the student. I can give you all. Yeah, John, I prefer that. I prefer yeah, that because yeah. then it's, it's nice, yeah. you know we can't hear the response of the students. That's why it's a bit weird that it's yeah. such a silence around. You know, it will be much nicer to actually hear yeah. the students' yeah. voice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then. I try unmute, but. You have to switch. The... I, I have um. Okay. Now it's okay. So, I actually um everything you're saying really resonates because um my self practice as a teacher I teach in New Jersey has really changed. It's evolved in a short period of time because it had to. I very I also thought oh let me try to keep it all the same, and it didn't work for me. I said these people know how to practice. My students know how to practice. And what I wanted to know was, how do I let them know that they still might need some guidance as they're there? Because some of them, five years, this is, I've been practicing 18 years. I mean, I know what you're talking about. But my fear is that many people are trying to muscle through things, not understanding the subtleties, and how can I help? 
Yes, it is exactly the same, uh, Debbie. What you're saying is that the, the teacher is still vital. The teacher is really important. And then teacher, I mean, when we chant Vande Guranam Charanadavende, there's a line in it that says jungle physician, like a jungle doctor. Like a doctor, we prescribe a practice to our patient student. That prescription is, in most cases, the Ashtanga Vinyasa system is a series, a series of asanas. So each asana is a pill, you know, to, to a medicine to, to, to work through. And so, yes, we're, we're, we're giving a set of um, postures to our student for the student to practice, but they do need to be checked in from um, time to time to see how the medicine is working. Uh, the, the principle there is that the doctor gives you your medicine, you go to the chemist, you take the medicine, and then it's up to you to have the, the motivation, the inspiration, the discipline to take your medicine. And, but then the doctor will say, come back in, in, in a week's time or two weeks and let's see how that's working. So yes, that, that it is important to have that connection there. Yeah, I feel um, right now, thank you so much for that very clear, and it really resonates with me. I have, I feel like I have uh, patients out there that don't want to go see the doctor. Yeah. And I feel like, and the only reason is, is because um, I've, I've had successes and maybe other teachers will, can identify with this by actually calling and reaching out personally instead of my my mass emails or something that that personal touch of like hey guys it's okay to ask the doctor for help yes you cannot you do not expect, i'm here for you to help me i i come to eddie to heal hear him help me i did john boltman's class to help me so let me help you if you're not seeking that out so thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Max. Thanks, John. Julia, you're ma amazing. Thank you. Very, so very young teacher. Um, so there are a couple of questions here. Um, in self-practice, is it better to do less but do it well yeah. or do more? Yeah, let's do that one. Um, Who's that one? That one's from Jay Connor. Jay Comer. Jay Comer. I'll read the question out, Max. In self-practice, is it better to do less but do it well or do more not as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I'm a counter, because I, I, I call myself counted method, I, I do the, the counted practice, I can do a training like a mantra. Um, for me, it's really interesting when you go into uh, symbology, um, and uh, sutra, for example, um, that every number has a special uh, quality to it. And so there is, there's a quantitative or, of, of number. So we could have um, a half series, a full series, so the quantity, but quality is, is for me the most important. When I said my first um, uh, intention, strength, stamina, flexibility, I was looking for stamina. It was so intense in Mysore 30 years ago, you really needed to build up stamina. When you do self-practice at home, solo practice, you've got to build up stamina. You have to build up stamina of body, stamina of breath, and stamina of mind. If you're learning to count yourself through, this is also stamina required. You'll get a, a headache the first time you start learning to count. So what's important is the quality of your presence in your practice. No two meditations are the same. And so although we're meeting ourselves each day in the same space, same place, same practice, what you experience will always be different. If you're practicing in the place of, of, um, of uh, respond rather than react, in that res respond, you will have new discoveries. This is what's important. And so for me, each practice, I may have had an intention. Uh, for example, I might explore Mulabandha today, or I might explore Udiyanabandha today, or I might just explore my hands on the floor, my feet on the floor, and I'll keep that focus for the entire practice. Can you keep that for 10 minutes? 
Can you keep it for 15 minutes? Can you keep it for, for 30 minutes? Can you keep it for your entire practice? So remember, Pratyahara is focusing as our, our, through our drishti, but focusing our mind through the counts so that you can go into a state of dharana, which is concentration. In that concentration, how long can you hold that concentration? This is yoga. Can you deepen the concentration? If you deepen that concentration, you'll go into uh, dhyana, which is meditation. Now, it's in meditation that you, you start to get um, totally focused in what you're doing and your response to and the, the awareness of what's happening, your attention, and your inquiry goes deep, then you'll find that you start to get revelation. And that revelation, whether if that just comes in the first 10 minutes or the first half hour, that's a quality practice. And so in the self, in the self practice, a solo practice, what is so much more important is quality of practice than quantity. Yeah? As uh, Deb was saying, some of the patients out there might need to be going to, to the doctor, but they're not, that if you're just bashing it away, then you're not going to get the longevity. I'm after longevity, as Julia says, we're going to die at some point. And the point, the, the most important thing is going to be the state of mind at that time of death, not necessarily the state of your body. We're all going to slowly have to let go. Let go, as I said, we're all in recovery. I've had a number of operations, and each operation, a recovery period. And if you then go into your imagination, you can imagine the healing, imagine the healing, and you can come back and still progress. The worst thing to do is set the limitation. I've had an operation. That means I have to come back to this. If you set that, that's your belief system. That's what will happen. And so and you need to be absolutely careful with your body. This is one yes. thing. Yeah, but you're not trying to restrict. You need to really see what your body can really do. And every time even you experience some injury, you're trying to get on the mat, try to work with that and see, just to don't stop practicing because you're told to stop practice. Because very often our injury is just a transition moment to something very new. And when we... Uh, pr when we experience in the, uh, the injury, but at the same time the practice is traveling through that injury with us, they're connecting. So at some point, the practice is starting to really solve the problem. But if we start practicing, we're absolutely stuck in one place. Should we have another question? Uh, many. Many? Wow. Yes, there is many questions. Check the chart and also... Um, Let's see, maybe some live question. Another one. Yeah. With a physical pain. Physical pain. There's so many questions. <laughs> we don't. We don't know the context. Actually, the physical pain generally, you let go from time to time. If you really feel the physical pain, you you have to let go from time to time. It means that if it, you if you can't stand it or you. Or just the question of getting used to, because this practice definitely brings the pain. And especially in you, if you're a beginner, you do feel uh, it quite strongly. But in some moment, your nervous system gets used to that. But I actually, I'm sorry, I don't know the context of all question. Okay, I'll answer it. Mm -hmm. To deal with physical pain, um, remember we are setting up an inquiry. The practice is always an inquiry. We need to go back to awareness, attention, inquiry, imagination. If you have physical pain, why? Yoga does not cause pain or injury. The way we practice our yoga causes pain and injury. Now, pain, physical pain, Patabi Joyce would say to me, first of all, pain, pain in knee, and if I said yes, you would ask me why. He would ask me why. And so that was me then learning, I need to ask myself, why am I in pain? What have I done to cause pain? And then he would clarify it. He would then say, sweet pain or sharp pain, bad pain. So in the inquiry, we start to become more of a connoisseur. Just as we are a connoisseur of our breath, 
the, um, the space that we give to the breath is how we hear it, the, the, how we feel the breath, um, how we see the breath, how we taste the breath, how we smell the breath. Same thing with pain. Does the pain um, keep you awake at night? Does, is the pain burning? Is the, does the pain make you feel sick? All these sorts of things. You, you have to set up the inquiry um, to first of all realize that you are the one that is directing this yoga practice. And it's up to, to you and the relationship with your teacher to reflect back. If there is pain, we're doing something wrong. We need to alleviate that pain, but we have to set up an inquiry to go back and work out what did we do to do that. And so it goes back to that other question. Do we do more or less in our self-practice? We need to do what's right for our body. That's what we want to do. We need to meet our body, meet ourselves. And as Julie was talking about that heart space, in, in that heart space of love, first we have to be able to feel the love for ourselves to heal ourselves. Yeah, but at the same time, what we wanted to address, because very often we actually do uh, meet uh, that in our classes, that there are students who practicing, or let's say people who experience in the practice, but they actually not do it, it with the body, they're not listening to the body. And then body is in pain because it, the one who is doing the practice and using the body is not listening what the body is really saying. It takes time also to, um, how do you say, to, to catch with one another, yeah, to start to resonate, to really start to listen to, to, to your body. Um, but what you can do is to really practice slowly, take eight breaths. Very often, if our nervous system is, um, is too, fired too up. Far, fired up, exactly, then the way we do in practice is also we put too much fire into our practice. So probably we need to slow down a little bit. Like, John, when you came back from Mysore first time, but I uh, said to John, eight breaths in the static meditation. So he had to really to, uh, to connect to his breathing first to really understand how he can uh, work with his body. This is a very, very important aspect that you're not trying to fight with your body. But it's really hard to explain um, when you're not, you can't really use the, um, show it on the body of the student how it happens, how the fight between student and the student's body is happening. There's a really interesting uh, question here from Cindy. It says, how to deal with the fact that you are a baby yogi? Only nine months with Ashtanga. Not ready to leave home, home is it? Or to have to leave the, to baby, leave the crib. baby crib. <laughs> it's, it's quite sweet. <laughs> Uh, Cindy, one thing is we're, we're all uh, beginners. No matter how long um, we've been practicing, we're always beginners. And as Julia said, I'm, I'm actually sitting on my mat doing a visualization practice uh, currently until I get the clearance from the uh, surgeon that my eye is okay. Um, and so even as a beginner, Ashtangi, um, the, right from the very beginning, you need to be doing your home play. I call it, instead of homework now, I'm calling it home play. And so uh, solo self-practice actually begins with just that letting yourself be more playful. Allow yourself to play and not to have the expectations. Nine yeah. months is... is <laughs> is quite a lot to, of uh, input from your teacher for you to be playing with at home. Um, and uh, it's lovely that you still consider yourself a baby. We're all babies in the unknown. And the, the more that we can return to being baby, the better. Because the baby is closer to the state of awareness, attention, inquiry, and imagination. Should we look for another question? Yeah. No, 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 wait one minute. Um, 
this is the online. John, there is one question about uh, Anya is asking about what to do if she has practice in the morning and after she has to go to job, but after she don't have energy. This is very interesting. Many, many students always, not always, but many students ask me also about this. I'm so curious, how is your, uh, you know, recipe, what to do? So they begin to practice before work or to practice after work? Before, before work is practice and after they, she don't feel lots of power, you know, to do the, the regular day and job and everything. What she do wrong, maybe, or something what she can do better. Um, that is the, the most difficult thing is to be, I would imagine then she's a householder in the Grutha stage. To be, to be someone that's responsible with the job is the most difficult uh, stage of yoga practice. There's four stages in India. There's the Brahmachari stage where you, where you are the student. And I was very lucky to be Brahmachari right up to the age of 36. I didn't become a parent until 36. Um, and the brahmacharya stage is when you have no responsibilities because the grasta is paying for you. Um, the, the, the householder pays for the, the student to be a student and it's their uh, duty to indulge and in study. To be a householder, so I, I have had two children and have two lovely adults now, um, but through that phase when they were totally dependent, my own personal practice went on what I call maintenance. I had to put it on absolute maintenance. You have to be a little more disciplined in terms of getting up earlier or taking the time. I remember I used to practice uh, before three o'clock before the pickup time. I haven't been one for getting up at four in the morning to practice. I find that very difficult. Um, uh, currently, um, it's, it's so nice to actually do a practice before teaching um, so that you are strong for the teaching. I would try and uh, the best you can with your support of your family or whatever to make that extra uh, effort to get up at five or six in the morning because it, it's going to be your foundation stone. It's going to be your resource. It'll, it'll prepare you for your day. I do agree with you. At the end of the day, it is difficult. And also, um, it, it, it... You're also full of information. Well, it also conflicts with family time, with dinner time. Um, and um, if it's then too late, you're too energized to go to sleep we can use that energy to carry us through the day. So the optimum time, especially now, right now on lockdown, if you get up early with the birds, the birds are so beautiful at the moment, and that's the real time to be practicing, uh, especially when you're starting your Surya Namaskars to be doing that pre-dawn before the sun comes up. So my advice is if you, if you can, to try and take some time in the morning before you go to work. Um, and again, it's, it goes back to that very first question, quality or quantity? And so for me, if you saw the sequence that we did today, I would change the sequence, uh, Sahana Vavatu chant, because that brings in that beautiful uh, protection of the principles of yoga. Even if you're working by yourself, that you want to nourish yourself, that you want to uh, create good energy for yourself that you want to find your voice as well from there a focus 12 just the simple focus 12 takes you into uh, a, a mindset where you're going to be really concentrating from there i then go into my 15 stretches i know that when i'm going to be much much older i'll still have my 15 stretches then you can go from your 15 stretches to vinyasa up to samasthiti and then chant your one day guranam and start your suri namaskars. And one of the things I've always said to myself, I'll just do the sun salutes today. I'll just practice my sun salutes today. And you know, after 10 minutes of your sun salutes, you go, maybe I'll get into the Padangrishtasana. Yeah, so if you can get yourself started, you might surprise yourself how much you're able to continue on 
in terms of um, giving yourself that time and space for you each day before you set your day off. And the other uh, thing, Anya, um, you mentioned that you do practice uh, first series. So uh, I don't know how many years you practice, but sometimes it's also worked this way that in, when we practice first years, it is quite challenging because you put so much energy into practice. And then little by little, you kind of balancing that out. That what happened with me. In the beginning, I was with all the traveling that we were doing with John and a lot of uh, people meeting in our life and intensity. I felt a bit overwhelmed with a lot of things going on and I, had, I felt that it's not enough energy but for me to hold all of that. But at some point, actually the practice balance that, your energy. So it's worth trying to not try to give you less, 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 less practice, but just to really hold that space for, for yourself when you do the practice, to do inquire, to, um, to put in intensity and to absolutely breathe strongly and do big inhales and exhale so you could really hear your breathing because also if you're not breathing properly, um, you don't have energy. For, for that so that process during your practice could go properly and energize your body. Max, do you want to do another question for us? Uh, there was someone asked about the Ujjayi breath and breathing. Now I read very fast, just maybe we can, I can, I try always, I try to see someone who want to speak to you directly. Just, I need to see the hand. Yeah. Because, um, would be nice for sure. I, I try to give the space, you know, for talk because maybe yeah. um, if friends, if you have some question, you can talk. Just show me your hand, and uh, I can I can switch your microphone. Okay, I see. Um, far, I'm sorry, I don't know how to spell your name. But just talk, just talk. You have voice. <laughs> Hi. Uh... Uh, John and Julia, uh, I have a question about vinyasa. Uh, if I use uh, extra breath, uh, it's a, a problem for my practice because sometimes I need more breath, not exactly vinyasa about a um, pair uh, asana. For example, uh, a asana ha an asana has uh, 15 vinyasa. Uh, in intermediate theory and uh, I have to uh, have more extra press. For example, uh, 17 or 18, it's, uh, it's because I'm too weak or uh, my breast is out of my control or my body is too weak or something. Okay, all breathing is free breathing. So all breathing is free breathing and just think of all of the word association for the word free. So the first thing is that W. Joyce would say, no holding the breath. Second one, no stiff breathing. Okay, so everything is free breathing. The most important thing is that you're free breathing all the time. So if you need to take an extra breath, it's an extra breath. Okay, because if you try to strain longer, you'll be going stiff to stopped. That then means the body is either uh, uh, strained, stressed, or you'll actually um, fire up your sympathetic nervous system too much. So everything is a free breath. If you do a full vinyasa, you can take as many free breaths as you like and some is to be here. That's where you can regulate. Then you can say, okay, it's 15 vinyasa. I'm going to see if I can go uh, 15 vinyasa and do the breaths per that. As we mentioned on our um, last chat with uh, Max, I mentioned that there's the um, dynamic vinyasa and the static vinyasa. The dynamic vinyasa are the vinyasas into the state of the asana 
and the vinyasa out of the state of the asana. The static vinyasa, if it's ashta or ustrasana, is um, then ujjayi. Okay, so we can challenge ourselves. Can I get to sapta without taking any extra breaths? If you do take an extra breath, make a little mental mark on your inner blackboard okay? so that you are accountable. So what the counting system does, first of all, is, is brings you to an accountability. If you don't know you're taking extra breaths, then you're not being accountable. You're, you've lost your awareness and your attention. If you know you're taking extra breaths, this is great. And you might specifically intentionally take an extra breath. This is great. Yeah? As long as you still know where you are, where you've come from, where you're going, this is vinyasa. And so if you've needed to take an intentional extra breath when you've jumped to sapta, you might go, okay, I need an extra breath, and then ashta, I go back. Okay? So if you go back into ustrasana on ashta, you try then to get um, five ujjayi breaths. The first inhalation, exhalation might be three, three. You then might get four, four, and you'd be comfortable on four, four. And then nava, you'll come up. Exhale, not counted. Dashes up. So you're counting all the way through. You get back to samasthiti, and then you take extra breaths. So we took an extra breath when we jumped in on sapta before we went back ashta. You've made a mental mark of that. So, okay, I need to work on my inhalation, the sound of my inhalation. What we'll all notice is that most of us can exhale and exhale fast, and you'll hear all the exhale loud. What we don't hear in a class is the inhale. And you want to be able to hear the sound of your inhale. So what the vinyasa uh, counting and specific number of breaths teaches you when you go into the inquiry of what is free breathing, what is ujjayi breathing? What are extra breaths? Yeah? When you take extra breaths, you're being sympathetic to yourself and you are able to, to, to note how many extra breaths you take. You go, okay, if, if I need to, to subtract those extra breaths, I need to work on the quality of that inhalation, the quality of that exhalation without it being stiff or stopped. So this is what I mean by being a connoisseur of the breath. Um, is, what was your name again, Farah? Farzan. Farzan. Is that, does, that, does that help? We've met, we've met, I think, in Purple Valley. In Purple. Yeah, Purple Valley, yes, two years ago. Exactly. Nice to see you. Did that answer your question? Uh, no, I understood. Uh, so it's better for me. I do intermediate, sorry, vin, full vinyasa, yes, because I can manage my uh, breathing in samasthiti and it uh, makes me um, stronger, uh, my inhalation and exhalation uh, stronger. It's better full vinyasa, yeah. Yes. And also the full vinyasa gives you an opportunity for you to um, improve you're concentrating mm. in terms of the vinyasa number, the counting. As you start from zero again, you reset the clock, and away you go again for the naming the next asana. So when you name the next asana, and the, you download the number of vinyasa, the state of the vinyasa, the program's already run. So you, 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 you're already beginning to use your imagination. You're visualizing, you're visualizing the posture. So many factors happen that way with that full vinyasa and that free breath. And very often what happens is that we really forget to breathe in, we breathe out very strongly and then we stop starting to lose the breath because our breathe in is not strong enough. So just really try to put attention there and to breathing, uh, take more, more long breath and it might change there. And uh, in traditional uh, press, uh, ujjayi is for uh, is ten uh, seconds inhalation and ten seconds uh, exhalation. Is correct? My information. No, ujjayi is is with sound. Okay, so like all free breathing is with sound. Ujjayi is equal inhalation, equal exhalation. Yes, mm -hmm. and that ratio can be one one. Two, two, three, three, four, four, all the way to ten, ten, or, or more. 
in an asana, um, three, three, four, four is about a good length. If you, if you think about Marichyasana D, a primary series posture, or even Ekapadashasana in a second series, or Kapotasana, can you get that, as Julia says, the sound of the inhalation, three seconds, and match the exhalation to that? That's Ujjayi. And I call it three-dimensional breathing. So what I mean by three-dimensional breathing is that if you're only breathing in and out, survival breath, that's only two-dimensional breathing. And most, most of that two-dimensional breathing is all exhalation, hardly any inhalation. If you work your inhalation, you then discover the third dimension. Breath has length, up the length of the spine. Breath has width to the armpits, to the side ribs. And breath has depth, the sternum and the back of the heart space. That three-dimensional, because what we are is a space-time continuum. We are a three-dimensional object with a three-dimensional breath moving through space and time. When you really start to explore that third dimension in your inhalation, you then start to not only transcend what was otherwise limiting in your thoughts, you also transcend time. And when you then transcend time, you are then shifting into that place where the imagination can really take you. If you're doing Kapatasana, you're doing that camel at the end of the day. Yeah, and then when you release out of it, you're then being that free-spirited bird when you fly out of the pose. So, so you're able to take yourself into a beautiful place when you hold time in your hand. And that comes from that Ujjayi breathing, the three-dimensional, because Ujjayi is the victor, the victorious breath. And it's through that victorious breath that we really do conquer or become the master, the mastery over our mind, breath, and body. And we're looking at the time. <laughs> um, Maybe, I, I know. Um, John, can we have one small question? Because I gave already to someone, just very yeah. small. And Nancy, I give you the voice. I think you, you, can, you can talk. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I'm learning, um, I'm doing my yoga teacher training. And I'm finding myself like in scenic panic when I have to teach a class. How can I find my inner voice? How can I find my, you know, overcome my fears? So have you experienced the Focus 12 before? No. So um, quite simply again, on your hand, you can count to 12. Yeah. Akam, Dwe, Trini. Chitwari, Pancha, Shat, Sapta, Ashta, Nava, Desha, Ekadasha, Dwadasha. That beautiful spiral. Six seconds out, six seconds in. So sometimes I'll go Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Go around. It could be Om Mani Padmi Hum. And if you, if you start to learn how to do that, just you might just completely imagine it and make it up for yourself, a new one. So what you're learning to do is to focus your mind through the power of the breath. Eventually you'll realize that you're able to be able to go. Exhale to six. Inhale to six. Just in one exhalation, one inhalation cycle, you've reached dharana. I found this in a Shivananda book that there was a formula for dharana, dhyana, samadhi. And the formula was that dharana was 12 seconds of cognitive singular thought, unbroken for 12 seconds. The dhyana was 12 times dharana. And samadhi was 12 times dhyana. So when I did the maths, so I sat down and did the maths. And 12 seconds, basically, when the previous question was about Ujjayi, was it 10, 10 seconds, 10 seconds? 
if you do a Ujjayi breath at six seconds, six seconds, six seconds out, six seconds in, that's a total of 12 seconds. If your sense of hearing, touch, sight, taste and smell, all five senses, Pratyahara, are directed on the sensation of that breath for six seconds out and six seconds in, then you've reached the state of dharana. So just in one breath cycle, you can bring yourself to concentration, yogic concentration. It's in that place of yogic concentration that you leave all of those limitations that your mind is setting for you. Yeah. yeah? So on your teacher training, before you start to present, to find that inner voice, you have to first find your inner breath. Yeah? Thank when you. you. Breath, your voice will write that prana. Okay? I often find myself exhaling to six, inhaling to six. I often find myself going on the Mahashavaya to six, on the Mahashavaya to six. It's my personal mantra. If I'm in a queue somewhere, if I'm having difficulty with something, I'll go into my breath mantra. So it's like the state of the asana. You do your ujjayi breathing. Okay? How's that? Max. Thank you, John. I, how I explained before is up to you. We follow you. So <laughs> don't ask me about stop the program. Just, uh, you know, up to you. Tell me when we... Julia can find one more, one more question and then we can do one more chant and I'll translate the one more chant and we can finish on that. One, how as a community can we hold space for people who have no access to a studio or in a workshop for minorities as teachers, practitioners and studio owners? Hmm. How as a community, community can we hold space for people who have no access to a studio? or workshops. But maybe uh, Yaknar could talk about that yeah. because we don't know the, constant, uh, the yeah. context of, of the question. Of the question. Can you find, she know, she Max, can about... you find Yak now? Yakna? Yaknel. 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 Are you there, Yakna? Uh, wait, 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 wait. Um... Okay, 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 I got it. Okay, you can start. Hello. Um, thank you for everyone. Um, yes, the question is basically, um, as a community, as yogis, that um, the people that are here, we have such a privilege to have access to studios, to have access to the practice, and not everyone um, have those privileges to actually um, so easily um, go to rather a studio or a teacher or like keep growing in their practice and how like what kind of um, like from your experience because you've been practicing for so long and you've been teaching for so long um, it's just like tiny steps that we could create or make more inclusive or practice for people who have not such an easy access because now we are very lucky to just be in our home and just like have our home practice but uh, many people have difficulties it's not only now it's just like in our in a, in a daily life so um also questions for for studios too like yes i don't know if it, yeah i don't know if it's clear or uh, my what my mind is 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 coming up with is that Currently, Julia and I travel the world to places that um, host us to do workshops. People aren't traveling to us. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, in my earlier days of practice and as a householder, I did what I call privates. I did one-to-ones. Okay. When I did private one-to-ones, I traveled to the, the client student's place. 
So when you were saying when people don't have the access to studios or access to come to workshops, then the teacher can, like a doctor, do a home visit. Okay. If you're able, if if you're able to ex, uh, find that selfless place to go to the home of the person and do a home visit, prescribe them some postures, and ask them to see if they can do that tomorrow, the next day, and then go back and see them again. I mean, what better way to start people on a solo self practice? is to do a home visit and you prepare their space with them and get them started and then monitor it. Now that we've got this new technology of Zoom, we could also do it via Zoom. Yeah, but this is, this is the thing that the most important that the people in some point could do the practice themselves. Yeah. So we won't be dependent. We could hold one another, but we won't have to be dependent. Uh, or only on the teacher. We need at some point to find our own teacher. We need to come back to our teacher to reconnect, to see how we changed. But, but at the same time, we might never know who we really are if we don't really spend time only with our own selves. And I, I'm just thinking if Yankel was, uh, Yaknel was talking also about the financial, uh, that if the people don't have a financial possibility. Yes, also. Then it depends on the teacher if you if you um, can do it for free, do it for free. If you feel the will that you are strong enough and you are uh, don't feel or, or do an exchange. This is a thing. Sometimes people we're forgetting that we can still exchange with the people. Yeah, that it's good and people can give something back because then they feel that that there is a proper exchange of the energy. It's, it doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be money. But it is good when the people, if someone really wants to do practice, that they could do some kind of a service. Then it really builds the connection in between. And it's more, it becomes much more stronger than the exchange of, the, of, fi of finances. Yeah, that, that is a really how you can build a bond between one another. But it, you do it only when someone asks you. You do not come to someone because you feel that someone needs a help. Yeah? This is sometimes what's happening with, when we are young teachers and we want to help the whole world. Yeah? We, want to, we want to give everything. But we, the thing is that we're really doing that when someone asks us. When someone sees that you are a bit different, that you can give something. And you, you can always feel when people are just feeling that you know, they come and say, I don't know what is, but I feel that something is in your energy is different and what maybe you're doing. And then there is a moment and you can share some yoga. Yeah, then you can give uh, meditation, if you can give some salute and see how it really resonates with them. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. welcome. Should we do a, a finishing, uh, a closing chant? So let's sit uh, nice and comfortable. Sit tall again. And we will chant Punamada Punamidam.
as Julia said at the beginning of the class, the meaning of the chant depends on uh, <clears throat> what resonates with you. There is the official Sanskrit translation, but when you chant a chant many times, it's what it means to you that's most important. And so the meaning for that chant for me is where are you right now? And the answer is, you're surrounded by love, love and light. Where have you come from? You have come from the infinite pure source of love and light. What are you? You are one of the many individual representations of that pure love and light. What are you doing? You're being love in action, shining your light for others. And where are you going? You're on a journey of sharing that love and light on the way back to the infinite source of love and light. Namaste. So I wish to just thank you all for participating, for being there. And at the beginning of class, I was meaning to thank all of those that have pre-donated to uh, the Fund Me India campaign for Purple Valley. Um, and so I just wanted to just, my heartfelt thanks from Julia and I, yes. to thank you for all of those people that have supported. Yes, that. it is important just to say that uh, us in um, U Europe, maybe America and other parts, we have some savings, some of them, many of us. In India, people don't really have the savings for many months. They have savings maybe for one month. So what happening now when people don't have a possibility to work, they don't really have money to have food. So in that moment, we can support them even by really small amount of money because for $60, one family can survive. So thank you for those who could donate. Thank you for those who could just be with us and energetically connect to this uh, field. Um, thank you. And thank you all. So thank much. you, Max. Thank, you, thank Max. you for organizing that. Thank you, John. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. It was so much time. We don't expect uh, one hour, 30 minutes. Uh, connected is like one life uh, for me. So many information. I'm so happy because I record this uh, this conference, this uh, no, this class. If you if you allowed me, I can put uh, I don't know maybe YouTube or something after after. Maybe you can put a sound file up there. Absolutely, if you want to do that. So yeah. I think a student can listen again because it was similar. You remember with Eddie. So we listen again and again because was so much knowledge. I was not able to handle everyone, everything together. Yes, so that's why we to make it happen. Yes, and we have this technology now. So let's use technology. And I put on YouTube link, of course, to you, to, to, to everyone we can send. And uh, thank you, thank you again. Uh, Yes, stay safe, uh, stay at home. Love from us, from everyone to you, to every Thank student. You. We are so happy. And John, uh, we have the, the traditional, we put the voice to everyone and everyone say what they like. And we see because their voice would be little fighting, but no matter. So student, be ready, be ready. <laughs> I have to switch because uh, technology, technology, okay. So, three, two, one. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 <laughs> it's not so bad. I can see this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day to everyone. Thank you.
Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, all these students. I see you. Thank you. Bye. 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 No. No. <laughs>